I, I, I went to, well, I went to one, one one-week course in Rutgers, and that's what, that was 95 or 96, and that really pushed me over the top as far as I really needed to go back and study Yiddish. So then I went to, on a trip, a trip the next year to, uh, in 97, I took a trip to Eastern Europe because it was the celebration of, the, not the commemoration of the 200th anniversary of the Vilna Gaon. I wanted to go because family's related. So I, and I learned that in Vilna they had a Yiddish program first year. And I went back the next year. It was, a, I think, seven weeks I spent in Vilna. I loved Vilna. I had wonderful teachers. And I fell in love with learning proper Yiddish again, grammar and, and reading literature and, and being exposed to different theories and meeting people from all over the world who were learning Yiddish too. And so the following year I went to Oxford. I heard it's a very good program. And the next year I went to Columbia, and uh, that was very good. That was eight weeks. I spent a whole, went a whole summer in New York City, and I enjoyed that tremendously. And then uh, and after that, I've gone to various conferences, you know, I've met other Yiddishists. Uh, I translated a book. Uh, there's a Yiddish author who lived in Vilna in the, 19th, in the 1890s, Isaac Mayer Dick. Um, and uh, I discovered this book had not been translated into English, so I and a friend, she teaches Renaissance literature at Barry University, and she came from a Yiddish-speaking home, and I taught her how to read, and all of a sudden she realized this is my language. I know it anyway. She knew the vocabulary, just couldn't read it. So we sought to read, and we came across this book by Dick. It was a small, not, it's a novella, and we did it bilingual. One side was Yiddish, and one side was English. Uh, and um, uh, it was difficult. It was difficult because there were things, you, had to, you don't have footnotes in a novel, but we had footnotes because, for instance, uh, uh, they're talking about uh, she. She looked like she looked like she had just after Nila. Well, unless you know that Nila is the last prayer of Yom Kippur, they've been fasting for twenty five hours. You don't know it means that the person who hasn't eaten for twenty five hours. So you have to put a footnote because there's no way we're doing that in English. So we found that, that was something we had to compromise and put footnotes every every page. Especially when it came to uh, holidays, it was one part of the book where she says uh, he was twenty five years old and he another man would have been married and divorced fifty times by now. Well. It just so happens that in Europe, when a man was a, a, a traveler, and he had to, that on Mondays he would divorce his wife and marry her on Friday because if he was killed or disappeared and there weren't two witnesses, she's an aguna, an, an anchored woman. She can never marry anybody else. And so he would give her a quick divorce and marry her again on Friday. And, you know, so you had to have a footnote. And the book was full of footnotes, but, but the, the, the tr traditions in it were just amazing, amazing. Uh, and he talks about this ugly custom of women wearing white sheets. The women would dress up and cover themselves and then cover their whole bodies with a white sheet like a burqa. And I've seen pictures now of women in Eastern Europe and during the 19th century dressed that way. That they were just like the burqa. They would take, they dress up and bundle up and to, to, do, to the shape, get rid of their shape, and then on top of that put a white sheet and walk around the streets. Well, lots of customs, amazing customs. There's one port, part where the, she's, she has one daughter, a woman in the book, has one daughter who's not getting married, so she calls in uh, a, a soothsayer, and the woman takes hot lead and melts it and pours it into water and then takes the shapes that form and tells the future through shapes. And then I heard later on in other books that they did it with wax also. You don't talk, you're gonna, Am I describing it correctly? I never heard of that custom. Or, take, or uh, when a person died, you would take wicks, you know, the wicks you make candles out of, and stretch it out along the perimeter of the grave, and then use those wicks to make the special Havdola candles that, that they use on, shop, on, on Saturday night, the special braided candles. I mean, amazing things that our people did, you know, that I didn't know about, that lost, lost, lost. And it was, a re, for me, a revival. And a chance, when I teach, to tell my students these things. The richness of the language, the beauty of the language, the integration of the language and the religion and the customs and the, everything was all mixed together. It was wonderful. It was a great, you know, and uh, the, the, the fact that he writes in a colloquial Yiddish, he writes the way people speak, because prior to him, really, books were written in Yiddish in a kind of stilted Germanic Yiddish that nobody spoke, but the rabbis decreed this was the proper Yiddish for women. Like if you read the Sena Rena, it's not written in a language that no, nobody spoke. And after Dick, really came Shalom Aleichem and Mendel Mochesvarim and, and parents who picked up that and wrote the colloquial language that people spoke, and that's what made them such great writers. They probably put my words on a page. Well, for me, it was wonderful coming that close to that language, you know, and seeing how much of it I had and how much of it I would lost, you know. Uh, so, much, so much of my English, Yiddish was Americanized in America. So it was a fascinating undertaking uh, of research, of 
amazing research. It was also a lot of Slavic words. It was, anyway, it took four years.